Hi everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor suggests that the current situation bears resemblance to the Cold War era, where individuals suspected of being Soviet agents were often detained for exchange purposes. However, he emphasizes the need for caution, noting that not all detainees turned out to be agents. McGregor questions whether a similar scenario is unfolding now. He highlights the Wall Street Journal's strong anti-Russian stance and neoconservative perspective, urging viewers to consider these factors. It certainly doesn't resemble the Wall Street Journal I grew up with. Consequently, there's little sympathy towards the publication and its owners, particularly Rupert Murdoch. As far as I'm aware, aside from Tucker mentioning it on his program, there hasn't been much discussion about the recent apprehension. The individual in question was far from Moscow, seemingly attempting to report on Russia's industrial impact amidst the war, despite potentially being a legitimate journalist, wandering near a Russian military installation during wartime is unwise, akin to someone poking around American military sites during conflict. While he may not officially work for the CIA, his anti-Russian stance would likely lead him to share any findings with them. Given Russia's state of war, it's understandable he was detained. Regarding military equipment. The American M-1 series tanks may not have arrived yet, but preparations are underway for their deployment to Ukraine. Other equipment, such as Leopards and Bradleys has already been dispatched. There's concern over Russian weaponry like the Coronet missile, which has proven effective against tanks in Syria. It's not just about the number of tanks, but the integration of various equipment types like armored vehicles, missile carriers and air defense systems. For instance, the Ryan Toll's 30mm automatic cannon linked to radar is vital for countering unmanned aerial systems. Ultimately, the recent developments won't significantly alter the situation. They employ what's termed active versus passive defense mechanisms. Active defense systems encompass various measures, like embedding small explosives in ceramic and metal tiles on tank armor, or installing radar directly on the tank to detect incoming missiles. However, these defenses have limitations. Most active equipment functions only once, leaving the tank vulnerable after a single strike, particularly from top attacks. Missiles that target the turrets. Thin armor from above. Efforts to counter this threat are ongoing, with innovative solutions under consideration, especially by the Israelis. Indeed, humans recognize these evolving threats and are developing countermeasures, although specifics remain undisclosed. This changing landscape compromises battlefield mobility and challenges traditional reliance on armored warfare. It's akin to the shift experienced during World War I with the introduction of machine guns, artillery, and trench warfare halting traditional maneuvering. We're facing a similar paradigm shift that demands adaptation. Regarding recent revelations from Bagajan of the Wagner Group, suspicions of deliberate tactics to turn certain areas into battlegrounds have been confirmed. This strategy aims to lure Ukrainian forces into vulnerable positions for systematic destruction, ultimately favoring Russian interests. Despite the potential for criticism, such tactics align with the challenges of modern warfare, where traditional maneuver forces encounter significant obstacles. In the ongoing conflict, leaving areas partially surrounded serves strategic purposes, compelling adversaries into unfavorable conditions while minimizing risks for the aggressor. This approach aligns with the complexities of the current battlefield, where large-scale maneuvers are hindered. The intention is to exploit enemy movements as articulated by Bagajan, prolonging engagements to weaken opposing forces gradually. As for Jack's perspective, while he may offer entertainment, his analysis appears clouded by biases and oversimplification. Yeah. Jack, I appreciate your interest in national defense. Another aspect that's overlooked is the intact bridges spanning the river and Zaporizhia and further north. These bridges are crucial for transporting heavy equipment like tanks and trucks. Despite calls from Russian citizens to destroy these bridges to prevent Ukrainian forces from crossing, it seems the Ukrainians' numbers have been decimated, minimizing the need for such action. However, there are reports of a potential Ukrainian counterattack, though its success remains uncertain and may result in further casualties. As for why the Russians haven't destroyed the bridges, it's not due to incompetence, but likely part of their strategic plan to utilize them. Ukrainian commanders have reportedly pleaded with President Zelensky to withdraw from the region, describing it as a deadly trap. The grim reality of constant casualties on the front lines underscores the desperate situation. However, amidst the standard narratives prevalent in the media, the truth occasionally surfaces. Nonetheless, progress on the ground is hampered by the challenging terrain, with mud impeding movement akin to wading through thick slime. This situation is difficult for Americans to comprehend, except perhaps in regions like southern Texas with its dense, muddy earth.
Regarding the outcome, there's a risk of tunnel vision in Washington, where the belief in Russia is inevitable. Defeat and withdrawal from Ukraine may overshadow conflicting evidence. Such cognitive biases have historical precedents, as seen in the prolonged conflict in Vietnam. The narrative presented by Jack highlights broader concerns, although specific details about the alleged coup remain vague. However, there's mounting evidence supporting the notion of external interference, as evidenced by Mr. Netanyahu's suspicions of a color revolution orchestrated against his government in Israel. The National Endowment for Democracy. Net is a significant player in various regions, often operating as a catalyst for what could be termed as color revolutions. Efforts to subvert existing governments and install ones more aligned with U.S. interests. This pattern was evident during the early stages of the Ukrainian crisis and in other instances, such as Kazakhstan. In response, Russia intervened to support the government's stability. Similar activities have influenced Belarusian politics, contributing to Lukashenko's alignment with Putin. In the broader context of Central and Eastern Europe, historical grievances and territorial aspirations shaped national agendas. Countries like Poland seek to reclaim lost territories from past conflicts, while Hungary laments the loss of vast territories post-World War II to the complex demographic and geopolitical landscape in these regions, reflect centuries-old power dynamics often overlooked by outsiders. Yugoslavia's dissolution was inevitable given the deep-seated religious and cultural divisions exacerbated by external interventions. The attempt to force diverse populations into a unified multicultural framework proved untenable, leading to violent conflicts. Kosovo's status remains contentious, with Serbia claiming historical sovereignty amid ongoing ethnic tensions and concerns over Islamist extremism originating from the region. The turmoil in these regions also intersects with broader security challenges, including the proliferation of weapons originating from conflict zones. Like Ukraine. Kosovo in particular serves as a hub for various illicit activities, including arms trafficking, with repercussions felt across North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah, that's essentially the crux of it. You have to trace it back to figures like Albright, Al Gore, Sandy Berger and Strobe Talbot, who were instrumental in advocating for interventionist policies aimed at creating a new order for the bombing campaign in Yugoslavia lasting 78 days, had far-reaching consequences, particularly for Orthodox Christians in the region. From their perspective, Western support for Islamist factions undermined their interests and fueled resentment. In the eyes of policymakers in Washington, dissent against their agenda is often perceived as malevolent, justifying punitive actions. This mindset was evident in how we vilified and mistreated the Serbs, much like our current approach toward Russia. However, such antagonism is likely to backfire, potentially culminating in a financial crisis and economic downturn that could prompt a re-evaluation of our involvement in Ukraine. The strain on our military resources, exemplified by depleted ammunition stocks and critical equipment shortages due to support for Ukraine, raises concerns. While the situation isn't inherently perilous unless we engage in reckless interventions, the prospect of escalating conflicts, particularly against adversaries like Russia or in the Middle East, is deeply unwise and could exacerbate tensions. Moreover, the consideration of sending more sophisticated weaponry to the region, as discussed in the media, is alarming. Such actions increase the risk of confrontation with Russia, for which we are ill-prepared. It's crucial to exercise caution and prioritize diplomatic solutions to avoid further escalation and potential catastrophe. The videos depicting the heinous acts against Russian prisoners of war, including sexual violence, have to surrender, have indeed been circulated by Ukrainian soldiers themselves. It's disturbing to witness such actions being shared online, seemingly as a display of intimidation or a twisted form of retaliation. However, there's a deeper motive at play here. There seems to be a vested interest, particularly within the leadership in Kiev, to prevent any potential negotiated settlement between Ukraine and Russia. This isn't solely because of reluctance on Kiev's part to engage in talks, but also due to growing apprehension that Washington might eventually abandon them. There's a palpable sense of Ukraine fatigue, not just in Europe, but also within the United States, especially considering the evolving political landscape by perpetuating such atrocities and disseminating them widely.